at our lowest points in our career are also the opportunities for the most growth. It's making sure that you're running towards something and not running away from something. Addie Reinhardt is an amazing young veterinarian, and she's the CEO and founder of a program called MentorVet. She is a veterinary well-being researcher, and her research focuses on developing innovative interventions to support mental health and well-being within the veterinary profession. She is on the research team for the third phase of the Merck Animal Health veterinary well-being study and is currently collaborating with Merck Animal Health to grow and expand the MentorVet program. She completed a master's degree in community and leadership development and a graduate certificate in college teaching and learning from the University of Kentucky in spring of 2021. She is incredible with this program, but more importantly, her story is beautiful and very relatable. And she made a lot of her career decisions by focusing on her values. So I'm excited to welcome and introduce you to the amazing Dr. Addie Reinhardt. Uh, I do want to thank you for coming and sharing your story. And I know part of your business right now is a lot of sharing your story over and over again. So hopefully I'll ask some additional fun questions for you um, because I, I think you more than a lot of people understand, I think what I am trying to do with this podcast, and it's really to help our colleagues, both veterinarians, vet techs, and, and lots of people who are going to go through some, maybe some questions about what they're doing with their, their life, their work. And so I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about your story and what makes you excited about working. So you were talking about um, your mom and being in Kentucky as well. So is that where you were born? What, what was little Addie like? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I actually grew up on a farm in rural Tennessee. So I, um, my mom is a nurse. Uh, my dad is an entrepreneur. So he, um, we owned a music store growing up. So it's kind of a fun fact that not many people know about me. Uh, but yeah, the first six years of my life, essentially I, I was in the music store and, uh, it was a family business. So we all kind of were working even little Addy, uh, in the music store and, uh, working on the farm. So there's always something to do, whether it be in the store or on the farm, we had llamas and goats and chicken. So it wasn't like your typical farm, uh, more of a hobby farm, but we did breed llamas and goats and sell llamas and goats. Um, so I think that because of those early experiences, experiences. I always was really drawn to animals. Uh, but seeing my mom and doing that work, I didn't really think that I would be able to kind of do medicine because I never really liked human stuff. And I thought that, you know, it's gross that she came home with, you know, vomit on her scrubs Mm -hmm. or, you know, all all the different things. I said, I don't want that. I don't want to, I don't want that. Um, so I ended up, uh, being very interested in, in biology and education. So I started off at East Tennessee state university, uh, for my undergrad and really was, uh, wanting to do high school biology teaching. I got into being, becoming interested in, um, kind of informal education. So I did an internship at a nature center in Asheville that I loved and, it was there that I met a veterinarian and I learned about the veterinary career through this vet and really found that this career was, um, it was a really interesting mix of science and teaching and then also getting to help animals. So I started looking into the career of vet med in undergrad and, uh, and I, I started some shadowing experiences, um, discovered that I could actually handle the gross stuff when it was animal stuff. Um, and so from there I, 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 um, applied to vet school and and got into UT vet school. Oh, fantastic. So I do want to back up just a little bit. Since you worked in the music store, did you play an an instrument? Yes. Uh, yeah, we, we play, I, I play a lot of instruments. Uh, so we, um, after the music store closed, we kept a lot of the instruments that we used to sell. And so we 
um, play music together as a family, even still, like if I go home, um, oh, yeah. for Christmas or the holidays, we all play music together. Um, I play my main instrument. So I learned, um, initially on piano. So I'd say that's like my most comfortable instrument. And then I also play ukulele and cello and guitar. I played in a jazz band in high school. I played saxophone. And, uh, so yeah, I think those are kind of my, my main instruments, but I also can pick around at a, at a bass and, uh, things like that. So, so whatever, whatever instrument there are, there is there, I'll, I'll, I'll play it. <laughs> I love that. Well, I mean, it's so wonderful to kind of have, a you know, a creative side, biology side, you know, there's, there's a lot to us that we can enjoy. So, um, so sorry, going back, you, you got into UT vet school and what did you think you might do? after vet school, just getting in. Cause we, we often see that we change our minds sometimes along the way. So, yeah. So I think when I first started vet school, I, I didn't really have a specific direction. I think I remember every year we had this survey that, uh, the leaders in our class would send out and we would, it was like a Google doc where we would put in each year, what our career goals were each year. And I remember first year I was like undecided, no clue. Um, I'm just kind of seeing where this thing takes me. And then, uh, I think second year I was leaning more towards mixed practice. I really liked both small and large. I think into third year, I was leaning more into exotics and ophthalmology. Uh, and then into fourth year, I was kind of on the fence about, ophthalmology residency or seeking, um, you know, opto specialty or going into GP. And I just remember a lot of conversations with my husband of, you know, should I apply for an internship or should I go into GP? And then ultimately I decided, uh, GP at least for the first few years, just so I could have that solid foundation of medicine and surgery so that I could always fall back on that because I didn't want to be limited on where I lived in the country. I wanted to be kind of flexible. My husband's a 3d artist, so he's kind of specific on where he can live. And so I wanted to be the one that could live anywhere. And right. If there's animals, there's vets typically. So I wanted to get that experience in GP and be able to have that if ever in the point of my future career, I wanted to come back to that. I would have that. Uh, so that's, that's what I ultimately decided to do. Um, coming out of that school was, was general practice, small animal. All right. So you're working in general practice and then what? So, so yeah, I, um, started off at a small animal practice here in Lexington. So we moved, here, uh, my husband's family was born and raised here. So it was kind of a natural next step to, to move here. Um, the first practice that I worked at, I was there for I think 10 months. And then I, um, switched jobs to a different practice. I started working in rural Kentucky, which was a new experience. Cause I was working in the city of Lexington before. So it was a big shift in clientele, um, kind of from more, um, I would say needy clients with a lot of money, uh, shifted towards, uh, clients who might not have as much money, but they were also some of the most grateful people in the world. And so I feel like the bar was pretty low for me in rural Kentucky. So anything that I did was just like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. So that, that was kind of, I liked it better. Like I really liked working in rural Kentucky, but with transitioning into rural Kentucky, that also kind of came along with a lot of tough ethical situations. Um, particularly around limited client finances. And, um, you know, despite really enjoying that type of work, I think experiencing it every day or multiple times a day, uh, gets pretty exhausting when you are, you know, navigating these tough ethical situations and, uh, the owner's upset, the animal is upset and doesn't get a win and the vet's upset. So it's, it's kind of, crappy for everyone involved. And, uh, I think after a while of kind of this moral stress and, uh, ethical trauma, I, uh, eventually burnt out. And I think that 
part of that was that I wasn't setting good boundaries for myself. Uh, I worked in a really supportive environment and I loved my mentor. I love the practice. I love my coworkers. There was very little conflict with my team or my boss or really any of that. But I think for me, at least a lot of my burnout was related to kind of this ethical stress that I was experiencing as well as just trying to work really, really hard without caring for my own needs. And so just, you know, working perhaps and taking on a bit too much, not being able to say no, if something walks in the door, things like that. And so, you know, at first it it was fine, but then after a while it um, kind of wore on me and, uh, and then that led me to a a Walmart parking lot, emotional breakdown um, at about three years out. Um, And I just remember calling my mom. Uh, That's kind of, you know, I, I have, when I'm kind of in these emotional uh, breakdowns, I kind of have a, a workflow of what I do. And so typically the first thing that I do is reach out to someone that I care about. So in this instance, it was my mom and I was talking to her and I was like, I just don't know what I, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I don't know why I'm doing this to myself. Um, I don't know why I keep pushing myself so hard. And I just feel, I think that that was the moment that I realized that I was really severe, severely burnt out. And, um, it was really fortunate that she's a nurse. So she's also experienced these things in her career. So she was able to kind of support me through that. Um, and I think at our lowest points in our career, are also the opportunities for the most growth. And so I think that, um, from there, you know, you've hit a bottom. And so the only way to go at at this point was up. And, and that's kind of where I, um, where I continued forward. And so I started realizing like, okay, I need to start taking care of myself, need to start taking boundaries or setting boundaries. And I really, um, started to, look at how I could be well and healthy within the profession and made efforts to put myself first, um, which I think helped everyone around me, including my clinic and my patients. Um, so, so yeah, I think that was a a good moment of, of realizing that there were things that I needed to be doing to make sure that I stayed well in the profession. Yeah. So just as an example, did you, you know, say, Nope, it's time for me to go home we can see you in the morning, those kind of boundaries, or what were some of the next actions you took? Yeah. So I remember starting to like seek out external resources, like education and training. Uh, I think I I looked for different, um, like leadership programs, mentorship programs, things like that. Um, you know, looking at CE at conferences, I started attending more of the professional development sessions and I, um, started, I think the biggest step for me was starting to vocalize how I was feeling to my employers. And so a big step for me was meeting with my mentor and my boss and telling him I'm feeling burnt out and how are we going to go forward from here? What can we do to make sure that I can stay happy and well in this practice going forward? And that's a scary thing to admit. Um, and, but I think it was, it was so important for them to know because a lot of times we're pretty good at hiding that there's an issue, right? And sometimes we don't even know that there's an issue ourselves. And I think that was kind of where I was at is that I didn't really realize that there was an issue until I reached severe burnout. Um, but I think it's such an important step to be able to, um, admit that there is something going on to your employer and hopefully they're going to be supportive of helping you create changes. I had some ideas of things that we could do going forward to make it better for me in the practice. They made some um, alterations. So they really started honoring my lunch break and made sure that um, I was you know, getting time to take a lunch and getting time to take breaks, um, trying not to overbook or double book. And so there was really an effort on their end to, to make me 
more comfortable within the practice, which I've seen happen quite a bit when, when people actually start reaching out for help. So I think that's something that was really impactful for me because I think sometimes we think that, um, our employers are, you know, just out to get us, or, I mean, sometimes you are in a really toxic environment, but oftentimes that's a human being on the other end, they're dealing with their own stressors. Right. And a lot of the things that come about as far as policies go are happening because they need to pay the staff and they need to uh, keep the lights on in the clinic. And so sometimes that, um, conflict that arises, uh, happens because of that and not because they're bad people. And so I think when we start having more vulnerability in the workplace and talking about these things more openly, uh, I think it creates a much, um, healthier environment where we can move forward and make adaptations along the way, uh, to make, again, make it healthier and happier for you. Yeah. I really appreciate that as well, because, you know, trying to look at it from the leader's point of view, it's hard to help if they don't know that there's something wrong. So, you know, that, that can be our role in letting them know when we are struggling or when we do see something wrong and then they can help us address it. So I'm glad that they responded very encouraging for you. And so you're, you're doing some more CE, you're kind of exploring. Um, when do you start getting the idea that maybe I want to really shift my career and what it looks like? Yeah, so I remember attending an AVMA conference and there was a career transition workshop. And up to that point, I'd kind of forgotten that there were other opportunities within vet med. Like, and it just seemed like a whole lot. And we were living in Lexington. There wasn't like a whole lot of career opportunities here in Lexington. And we just bought a house within the last few years. So I, I kind of didn't even think about career transition for a long time, but I went to that workshop at an AVMA conference and I, I was like, oh, okay, there's, there's other things that I can do within this profession that aren't necessarily clinical practice. I mean, at this point I was post burnout, I was pretty content in practice, but I was also starting to feel like the next step for me in practice was going to be practice ownership. And I didn't really want to own my own practice. And so I was trying to figure out the next step for me in my career for me to feel fulfilled within this veterinary profession. And, and I didn't see myself being an associate for long-term. So going to these career transition workshops, I started looking into alternative career paths, um, you know, looking at jobs and, um, regulatory and policy and public health, uh, as, as well as starting to explore, um, you know, what kind of additional education opportunities there were. And I, I remember I applied for several opportunities and, and I got declined to like three different, um, internships and, uh, residencies and kind of, um, uh, fellowships. And, and in the, that moment, that was really tough. Cause as a high achieving individual, I was like, how am I getting declined for everything? Right. Uh, but I think it was also a good moment to reflect on, okay, what opportunities am I applying for and why, and really starting to dig into what are some of my professional values and what potential opportunities will align with that. And when I started doing that and, and actually started listing out values on a piece of paper. And I remember making this little map of my values and writing them all out. Um, I, I saw that a lot of the opportunities I had been applying for did not really fit or match those values. And so I, I realized that they could probably sense that in my applications too. So it was fortunate that I wasn't accepted because I, um, after doing a lot of values work and introspection, um, really remembered how much I like school and I excel in a learning environment and a structured formal learning environment uh, and how I really wanted to um, do more research and teaching and get back into the learning environment. So that's what I did. I um, applied for graduate school here at University of Kentucky, which is in Lexington. So around this time, my husband got a great job here in Lexington. So again, we weren't moving anytime soon. He had moved uh, for me before for vet school and uh, first job. So I wasn't going to um, you know, make him move after he just got a good job. So, um, I applied for a couple of programs at, at UK, one of which was the, uh, masters in community and leadership development. I was really excited about this program because 
it aligned with a lot of my interests. So there was some education around um, how to be a better researcher. There was some training on how to be a better teacher. Uh, There was um, training on how to build communities and develop yourself as a leader. So I was like, this sounds like exactly where I want to be. And it offered enough flexibility in the curriculum that I could start exploring some more of my interest, uh, as well as give me some of the tools and skills that I needed to excel. And um, so essentially starting this program, my research mentor at UK, um, I I started and I quit my full-time job in the summer of 2019. And my research mentor on the first day of the program uh, asked me kind of to come up with three ideas for research projects for the two years that I was going to be there for my master's degree. And I, I remember that uh, I, I, I proposed this idea of a national mentorship program because it had been something I've been thinking about for over a year, because when I was looking for resources, when I was experiencing burnout, there wasn't really a national mentorship program uh, and this surprised me. And so my idea was to create some kind of national mentorship program that accounted for supporting vets in the transition to practice and some of the challenges that they might be facing and really help support them in the transition to practice. And so essentially I I proposed that idea and I said, do you want to hear the other two ideas? And, uh, and she said, no, no, stop there. Like, this is what you're doing. This is going to be so successful and you don't even know it yet. And she, she was just empowered me to really, you know, get excited about this vision that I had and really empower me to pursue that. Cause if at that point she had said, no, this is kind of a dumb idea. Like, let's hear your other thoughts or like, this doesn't really align with our research plan here in this department. What else do you have? I don't know that mentor vet would have even happened. Right. Yeah. So, so this, this moment in time of, of these, um, my research mentors uh, saying, no, we're doing this and we're going to help you was a, a really important moment in MentorVet's journey. So I spent um, essentially two years there uh, researching early career and uh, the, the challenges associated with it, developing a pilot program uh, that would help support well-being in the transition to practice. And, uh, and that whole process was um, it, was, it took, it took a long time. I mean, it took about two years to really get this program, uh, piloted and get the data and make it really impactful and meaningful. Um, and then one of my other research mentors, Dr. Elizabeth Strand connected me with Merck Animal Health and they learned about my project and then they wanted to support it in whatever way possible. So they became a founding sponsor in the spring of, um, 2021. I launched my, my, formal company mentor vets in, uh, March of 2021. So our, our one year anniversary is actually on Thursday, which is really exciting. Oh, happy anniversary. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, and that's, uh, that's what I've been doing ever since, uh, grad school is, is just full time on this project. So what have been some of the, the challenges through this process that you might want to kind of alert some people to? <laughs> I mean, there's always lots of challenges along the way, especially when you're making something new. Um, I think that, you know, for anybody like that's considering transitioning careers, one big takeaway that I had through my experience was just making sure that you're running towards something and not running away from something. And so that values work and really discovering what is it that I actually want to do outside of clinical medicine and why really helped me clarify what my next steps were going to be. And so I think that would be kind of one big takeaway. And then also, I think the aspect of kind of never giving up, especially if you're doing something like entrepreneurial, it's hard and you're going to get a lot of no's and the no's suck because you're so excited about something and you don't understand why somebody else wouldn't be excited about this thing. And so when you're going through this process, um, and, and I remember some advice that my dad gave me because he's also an entrepreneur and I, I remember him telling me, cause I had a, a no at one point that, that stung and, uh, I was telling him about it and he said, you know, Addie, for every 10 no's, there'll be one yes. And 
the yeses are, are what will keep you going. And the no's are important too, because you don't want to, you wouldn't want to collaborate with somebody that isn't really excited about what you're doing anyway. And so that, that advice really helped me to be able to move forward because you do get a lot of no's, um, if you're going to start something new and, um, and there are hard days, but if you just keep going and following your vision, eventually you'll find other people that are excited about what you're doing and, and want to support it as well. I, I love so much of what you said. First of all, the, the values graphs or, or things that you were drawing. I think that's such a good idea to kind of focus you on where you want to go. And then once you're in that direction, I'm glad you had so many people that were mentors for you. So mentors for the mentor vet. Um, what do you have any thoughts around people who may not have parents who, who quite under, know, understand what you're going through, how, how might you find mentors to kind of help you work through some of these questions that you're having? Yeah, I think it's always important to have uh, multiple mentors. So, you know, like you said, fortunately, I have wonderful parents that could help me through a lot of these challenges. Um, but there's also a lot of things that they did not understand about what I was doing, too. So um, for me, I think being proactive about seeking mentors is really important. And um, you would be surprised the places that you can find mentors. And so you don't always necessarily have to go through a formal mentorship program like MentorVet to find mentors, although we do have wonderful mentors. There are other places that you can look, um, you know, going to networking events at conferences and meeting people and just being proactive about asking people if you make a good connection asking them if, if you could meet again. And then at that meeting, ask them if, if they could be your mentor. And so I think that, um, being proactive about seeking mentorship, not only in, in kind of formal structures or within your practices, but also looking outside of your practice, even looking to a classmate. So peer mentorship is also very effective. Um, so finding somebody who might be going through similar experiences as, as you are and, uh, you know, just connecting regularly and providing support to one another. Uh, so I, I think that being creative on where and how you find a mentor and also being proactive about asking for it is super important. Um, another place you can start looking for mentors is within your organization. So joining um, local state VMAs or getting involved with um, interest organizations or organizations that are, um, you know, aligned with your identity, uh, I think can be a, a nice place to find mentorship. So um, for example, Wabaldi for women's leadership, um, I'm sure there's individuals within that community that are more than willing to be a mentor. And so Yes, I think seeking mentorship outside of the practice and then also more than one mentor and then being proactive about it. Love that. So what has you most excited these days? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think we are, we are growing so much. So in the fall, we launched our first large cohort of MentorVet. We had about 75 vets going through the program. Uh, we have 150 vets going through the program this spring, which has been uh, super exciting to see the, the rapid growth of the program. And I think what excites me most is just to see the transformation from start to finish from some of our mentees who are starting off, not even recognizing that they're burnt out, going through the first module, learning about burnout, and really starting to make some of these changes to make themselves happier within veterinary medicine and seeing by the end, um, so many stories of, of how this program has impacted their careers. I think those stories keep me going and drive me for what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm very excited to see a lot of the, the results and research coming out from our program evaluation. And so essentially a lot of these stories are, are not just anecdotal. We have um, evidence and data to back up everything that we're doing at MentorVet. And so in the fall, we did a program evaluation of, um, of the MentorVet program and found that the uh, mean well-being scores of the individuals who went through the program was significantly higher than a comparative uh, population from the Merck Animal Health Veterinary Well-Being Study. 
Um, we also found that these individuals are more likely to feel like they had a healthy way to manage stress than the comparative sample. And they were much more likely to seek out help if needed after the program as compared to before. And so all of these things combined just give me so much hope because really what I'm, I'm looking to do for this program is not be a forever, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not always going to be there and mentor vet's not always going to be there for these individuals. So really empowering them to help themselves so that they do know in the future when I'm not around how to ask for help and who to ask for help from. And then also learning all these skills like stress management going forward, that's something they can use for the rest of their career. That knowledge isn't just going to go away. And so really seeing these skills and these things being built in as they're starting their careers that will really help empower them to thrive within the profession has really filled me up with a lot of joy. Um, so, so I'm really excited about that. And just also kind of, we, we have a lot of exciting things going on in the, in the mentor vet, uh, community right now, but we also established our advisory board at the start of the year, which has been super exciting to see, um, so many leaders within the profession really excited about helping us grow and helping us, um, you know, with our, with our strategy over the next few years. And so, um, establishing the advisory board is something that I'm actually really excited about as well, as well as the additional programming that we're planning on creating over the next few years. So, um, part of this, uh, mentor vet journey is, is realizing that not only are new grads struggling, but a lot of other individuals within the profession are also needing help um, as well as our veterinary team. So what kind of evidence-based programming can we create to help these individuals to support them uh, in their careers and empower them to thrive and um, really creating these healthy habits and, uh, and really starting to open up these conversations um, and creating these safe, sp safe spaces for vulnerability that um, anyone in the profession can come to MentorVet and we have a program available for you in times of need. So have you kept in touch with your master research advisor? What does she think of where you are now? Yeah, we still text. Um, so it was funny the other day, she texted me about, um, I, I work a lot with uh, Qualtrics surveys and uh, she always, you know, thought that I was like a master of Qualtrics, which, which I'm not, but I'm pretty good at Qualtrics. So the other day she texted me and, and needed some help on, uh, you know, a quick thing for her survey. And I was so like honored that she, she asked me for the help. Uh, but then, you know, we started chatting about, uh, you know, the project and the program, and she's definitely really proud of where I have taken this. And, um, I don't think that they're really shocked or surprised because, you know, all through, through grad school, they were just like, you know, in awe with what I was creating and, um, we're so supportive, but yeah, we still, we, she lives here in Lexington. So, um, her and her husband were my two research, um, advisors. And so I, I, my husband and I will go out to eat with them and just reconnect. And so that's been, um, really special to just kind of stay in touch with them still going forward. Oh, that's really special. Is it perk to not to staying right where you are? You you're yeah. still surrounded by all the people who have made this happen and continue to encourage you. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. So, um, before we go to some rapid fire questions and don't worry, they're not too crazy. Um, any last bit of advice or maybe something I should have asked you wish people asked what, what advice do you have in general for our colleagues? So, yeah, I think, my biggest advice for anyone's profession is asking for help if you need help. And there's nothing wrong with that. There, there are tough moments in this career. And I know that because I've experienced them. And until we start opening up and becoming more vulnerable about our experiences, um, we're not going to, we're not going to move the needle on this, um, mental health and well-being issue that we're seeing. So I would love to see a veterinary community that is, um, both really open about the challenges that we experience, but also in a, in a productive way. And so instead of looking at challenges as, you know, horrible, there's no way forward. Um, but instead looking at our challenges um, and, and the opportunities for growth and how can we make this challenge, um, better 
and what can we do to be um, healthier within the profession? And so, you know, if, if, if something like client conflict is really stressing you out, talk about it, but then also talk about how you're going to make that better and less stressful and doing things like seeking training and conflict resolution or debriefing with a coworker. And I'm not talking a rant session, but just debriefing in a healthy way. Right. So I think if we can create these structures of, um, vulnerability and support, um, I think that would be really helpful for our profession. I definitely agree on that. All right. Well, thank you for, for coming. And I I have a couple of last minutes, like I said, rapid fire questions, which are just fun and a good way to wrap up. So first one is what is something that is on your bucket list to do? Woo. I would say go to New Zealand. Um, so I've always wanted to go to New Zealand and I have not been there yet. And, uh, and Iceland too, I would, I would add that to the bucket list. So, um, just traveling to beautiful places. I love to travel. I hear that. Mm -hmm. All right. What is a simple moment that brings you joy? Hmm. I think afternoon dog walks. So, uh, every day my greyhound will whine until she gets to go for a walk. And it's, um, a good reminder for me. It keeps me accountable on my self-care. And so every afternoon we go for a walk and I just love that little, um, brief break for, you know, 10 minutes just to be outside rain or shine, um, cold, hot. It doesn't matter. She, she's going to get her walk. So, uh, those moments of, uh, you know, just walking her has been special. Our pets keeping us accountable. Gotta yep. love it. <laughs> All right. If you could create a law that everyone had to follow, what would your law be? Hmm. Man. Well, you know, I think this is just good advice in general for organizations going forward, but, um, one thing that every organization could do would be offer an employee assistance program. So uh, everybody, uh, and every company has an EAP so that their team can get free access to mental health, um, care to direct them four next steps on their mental health. Uh, so yes, uh, your universal EAP, I guess would be my law. That's a good law. We got to get you into politics next. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. Final question is what is one thing you are grateful for? Mm, I have so much gratitude. So I, I, I think that my, um, biggest gratitude, at least over the last three months, um, has been my own, mentors. Um, and so there was a moment in January where I realized I took on a little bit too much work for the first start of the year and realized that, oh crap, I'm going to be working 60 to 80 hours a week, uh, until March and, um, had a moment where, you know, pretty, pretty down. Um, and I just reaching out to my mentors and, talking about it. And this, you know, was at BMX. So most of my mentors were actually at BMX. And so I remember having, I think five or six different conversations about the same thing. And I just remember how much that, that moment meant to me one to hear my mentors say, Hey, we've done this before too. It's okay. And you're going to get through this. And also my mentors who could help me strategize on how we're going to prevent this from happening again. Uh, so having both that emotional support as well as that um, productive problem solving was so important for me at the start of this year to really get me through um, this busy season of conferences and um, speaking and starting MentorVet and ending the last cohort of MentorVet and starting a new research project. Uh, so that um, support from others. I'm, I'm just so incredibly grateful for my mentors.